you know about economic bubbles, right? Uh, an economic bubble says something has great worth until it doesn't, okay? And a bubble means just like it's expanding, 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 then it pops and it doesn't. We saw that in 2008, right? We had the real estate bubble, right? Mm -hmm. And then if, you know, people were making gobs of money one day, and then the next day, you know, a million Americans have lost their homes. It popped. Okay? And the economic bubble only exists if we can keep up the story that it has value. These aren't new. Uh, Holland had an economic bubble based on tulips, right? Back, back in the middle centuries, uh, they went nuts for some reason over tulips. And tulips got up to the costing a house until they finally said, wait a second, I'm not going to give up my house to have a flower. And it popped. The Great Depression came about because the stock market popped. Right? Right now, we're in the carbon bubble. If our kids are going to have a future, that oil and that coal and the gas has to stay in the ground. That means the carbon bubble pops. That means no pipeline. That means no, pipeline. That, that means no infrastructure. But the way to keep the bubble going is like they did with the mortgages. Bundle up more risky mortgages. Bundle up more. As long as you're bundling up more and more and more and you're selling it and you still got people buying it, then obviously it has value because Joe just bought it. Right? It isn't until Joe says, I ain't buying it. And all of a sudden, Harry says, well, why did I buy it? It doesn't have any value. To make it look like it still has value, you keep doing projects. Because projects give the perception that we're 40, 50 years off in the future. So let's run a pipeline. It really isn't about running a pipeline. It's about creating the illusion that we need pipelines. And as long as we need pipelines, well then, by golly, there's money to be made. Let's invest in this. Until we say, wait a second. It's flooding here, and it's just because the moon is full. <laughs> Wait a second. All these millions of people who are on the move across the globe, it's because we've destroyed their land. Wait a second. We can't keep going this way. Pop. And then that $22 trillion disappears overnight. The divestment from fossil fuel campaign started just a couple years ago. And it's already in the trillions of dollars that have been divested from fossil fuels. It's, it's tremendous. Because you got to realize, if we can't burn this, then the worst place you could have your money is in fossil fuels. Because it's going to pop. Right? It's based on if it's wrong to destroy the world, then it's just as wrong to profit from that destruction. But the bubble ain't going to pop until we pop it. Oil companies, coal companies, gas companies are going to keep on doing what they're doing until somebody says no. The lead companies in 1920s, <coughs> early 30s, Science came out and said, you know, lead is bad. Lead destroys the brain. You can't keep painting and using lead. You can't use lead in water pipes. And the response of the lead companies is they launched a campaign to say the lead was good. Use lead. Lead's good. You can trust it. And they kept the regulations from being made for 40 years. It wasn't until the early 70s that lead was banned. We're still paying the price for that deception. The tobacco companies learned from the lead companies. And they said, let's hire a bunch of phony doctors 
put them in front of a camera smoking a cigarette and telling us how good it is for our health. And they delayed tobacco regulations for 50 years. Guess who the fossil fuel companies hired? They hired the very same advertising companies that work for the tobacco companies with some of the same scientists to say global warming? What global warming? The greatest picture I have is of this Senator Inhofe from Oklahoma standing on the Florida Senate with a snowball in his hand saying, this proves global warming is a farce because I have a snowball in my hand. <laughs> we are willing to believe utter nonsense until we're not. Until we say, you're talking about my kids' lives, you fool. You're talking about my kids' lives. How dare you treat my kids' lives so frivolously? It's time to get outraged. The rest of the world speaks of this crisis. It's only here that we don't speak of it. The head of the Bank of England says the vast majority of the oil and the coal and the gas cannot be burned if human civilization is going to have a chance at life. Okay, we measured all the coal and all the gas and all the oil, oil that we burned up into 2010. That's how much we burned, 1,821 gigatons. That's how much we burned since 2000. This is how much is on the books of the oil companies, the coal companies, and the gas companies. And they're still exploring for more, all right? That's how much of what's on the books is burnable before we destroy the earth. And that's based on two degrees centigrade. When I was at the Paris climate talks, going into the climate talks, this was the 21st meeting of the parties. 21 times all the nations of the earth had come together to see if they could reach an agreement on how to handle climate change. And for the very first time, they agreed, all of them, that climate change is real. It's happening now. It's caused by human beings. And the urgency to respond is crisis. But going into it, the modern nations of the world had agreed on two degrees centigrade. Two degrees centigrade, which they thought was comfortable because at the time we were at one degree centigrade rise. But the developing nations of the world, the island nations, the nations that are along coastlines, the nations that are subjected to, dr to drought, started a campaign during that Paris climate talk called 1.5 to stay alive. They say if we go to your two degrees, we won't live. We won't exist. And so the agreement coming out of Paris was the maximum two degrees and target 1.5 if at all possible. All right. That means that's all that can be burned out of that. Why is that a big deal? Well, it's a big deal because that means the oil companies and the coal companies and the gas companies have to write off $22 trillion on their balance sheets. 22 trillion with a T. That's why they're fighting this. That's why they're funding deniers. That's why they're paying people to be billionaires, to be Secretary of State and head of the EPA and the Department of Energy and the Department of Interior because they want that 22 trillion dollars. Because they think they can protect their kids from this. 
and to hell with the rest of you. But they're fools. They're fools. How are you going to protect your kids from the nuclear war that desperate people are going to launch? If we were to reach the 1.5 degrees, 1.5 degrees means that we would, in the modern world, have to eliminate the use of oil, coal, and gas within the next 10 to 15 years. 10 to 15 years. To reach the 2 degrees, we've got to 2030, the developing world has the 2050. All the nations of the Paris Agreement put in their voluntary targets, their goals, what they were willing to commit to. Great words. Fantastic idea. You do the math. It's not 1.5. It's not 2. It's 3.5. 3.5 degrees centigrade is right around 7 degrees Fahrenheit. Look at the storms and the drought and the crisis that we've done with less than three degrees Fahrenheit. Imagine tripling that. We are at the point where the urgency of this matter has reached a crisis point. We cannot be building any more infrastructure for handling oil and coal and gas. We have to get out of the business of oil and coal and gas. The idea that in 2016, we are building new pipelines to go across the nation to bring the world's dirtiest oil from the tar sands in Canada or to fracked oil from the fields of Dakotas is incompatible with our kids living. There's no plainer way to say it. If we keep on this path, my grandkids, all seven of them, are going to curse me as they die. That's not hyperbole. That's reality. 